Happy 4th of July, America. This is the Lutheran Answers Podcast. On today's episode, we have Twitter denizen literally chad at literally underscore chad. We discuss Tim Sledge's book, Four Questions That I don't know, Send Every Christian Into a Tailspin. I'm not sure. I read the book. It was dumb. And me and Chad spend an hour laughing about it as we go over Mr. Sledge's four questions that will apparently turn any Christian into an atheist. I hope you listen to this podcast and have a great time laughing along with us. And I sincerely hope that the four questions we ask do not turn you into an atheist. Let's cue that bump music. Atheist apologetic right. skit. So weird. <laughs> Take one. So, uh, welcome to the Lutheran Answers Podcast. I'm here with uh, Chatter, uh, Chad, literally Chad, Twitter Denizen, literally Chad. You can find him at literally underscore Chad. Is that correct? Yes. Excellent. Thank you so much for being on. No, not at all. Thanks for having me. Excellent. So, I wanted to just take, uh, basically take some time. And dunk on the atheists, if we could do that. Oh, that's... absolutely. It's a, I've seen enough atheists on Twitter this week that I need to go... Yeah, they've got this coming. Well, let me tell you what. Um, I, I can hardly... I can hardly get through a Reddit atheist thread without <laughs> worrying about my own faith. It is... Whew, if, if, if I knew what those fedoras mm-hmm. knew, Boy, let me tell you. It must be hard for them to find the hats that accommodate their cranium capacity. It's just... <laughs> yeah, they're massive brains. Mm. Yeah, for sure. For sure. So this is a book by an atheist author named Tim Sledge. And Tim uh, was a Christian and a pastor for a long time, like 30 years or something, maybe longer. I don't know. And he mm. has a doctorate from some Baptist school, I guess. And... He was, he, according to him, the quintessential Christian, the perfect Christian, and he left the faith because of these four nagging questions. And he says that if you honestly approach these questions and ask yourself these questions, you will lose all of your Christian faith entirely. And I read the book, Myself and actually ended up diving deeper into orthodoxy. Uh, I, I became a, a Lutheran shortly, shortly around the like right around the time I was reading this book. I went from just sort of reformed nothingness out in the ether over to confessional Lutheranism. Um, so I don't think it worked as intended, but I figured we'd give it a shot <laughs> and see. You're a you're a Roman Catholic, correct? Oh yes. Um, so just pure puppery over here. Um, and uh, have not have not engaged heavily with uh, Protestant Protestant perspectives on various things. So let me tell you, uh, they're terrible. Uh, so that's what all the Jesuits kept saying, and then we saw like the amazing uh, posters that we have up in the Vatican. Um, so I'm assuming awful, but uh, yeah. we'll see. <laughs> no, it's um, it's uh, nothing makes you want to be a Catholic quite like a Protestant. So let's uh, take a look mm. and see what we got here. Question number one, Chad. Mm. How could a loving God who created the universe do such a poor job at revealing himself? People don't believe in God. If he so choose or so chose, he could reveal himself to every single person on earth at the same time. He could translate, illuminate, and clarify his words such that every person would have to believe him. Or he could send messengers that would do such wondrous works that people would absolutely believe them. So, uh, so the the question is why can't we all have a Saint Paul experience? Mm-hmm. And uh, the answer to that 
I mean, uh, if you're... So, you have to throw out all of Scripture in order to have this criticism. If you accept Scripture, this doesn't undermine Scripture. Because if you look in the Old Testament, you look at Exodus, the entire story is uh, God shows them wondrous works, and then they still don't believe. They, um, they, they just... doesn't matter how much... Uh, what, what an atheist would call, oh, how many magic tricks did he do to convince you? It's like, no, no amount of ma magic tricks will actually get people to believe. Uh, we can look at Lazarus and the rich man. It's like, okay, look, um, you have these opportunities. You've been given, in fact, revelation. Um, we know that we have revelation um, if we assume that scripture is real, which this question presupposes. If, if you're just a Christian, it's like, well, if you're a Christian, you can look at the scripture and then find answers to this. Um, we all... Uh, every man receives enough grace to be saved. Um, what he does with that, a different story. But that we all have a, uh, enough res uh, revelation, that we all have a basis, that we have invaluable teaching. Now, this would be a Catholic-specific thing, but he did lead an organization that would hammer out the things that needed to hammer it out. There are things that are optional, like, oh, uh, what is the Christian stance on voting? It's like, well, um, you can probably make a go of it either way if you're doing it from a Christian point of view. Um, and so you're not going to get hell over that. But if it's doing the right things, like, well, we've got infallible teachers, we've got the fathers, we've got the scriptures, we've got um, living teachers, and we've got scripture that tells us that, no, no, we did, uh, we had miracles, and people don't buy it. Uh, a miracle won't convince you if everything yeah. else will. No, the, and, that, and that reminds me of an interview I watched on Pints with Aquinas with, uh, with uh, Father Vincent Lampert, and they were talking about, why don't you record exorcisms in the, in the church? Mm. You know, because then surely people would believe if you showed them this stuff. And his response was basically that, that even if we did record it, which would be morally impermissible because it's a very private and personal thing. But even if we did record mm. it, it's still, uh, it's still, they, the, the first criticism is, oh, well, that was Photoshop or, you know, video editing, green screen. You know, the, 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 they still wouldn't believe, even if you showed them. And, mm. the, and this gets me, so I'm not a Roman Catholic, obviously. Uh, help me with the Catholic doctrine here. But I believe, like us, and like some in the Reformed Protestant traditions, are you also monergistic as well, that the act of salvation belongs to God alone? So, uh, I'm, uh, I couldn't give you a, uh, a solid definition of monogenes, but there is a debate within Catholicism, um, between the Molinists and the Thomists. Uh, now, Thomists always believe that they're, uh, so no other group within the church has beefs with other groups, the way that Thomists have beefs with people. Um, but there's a question of, uh, <laughs> um, you don't hear about, oh, those Jesuits and those Franciscans are fighting again. It's like, no, no, no. There's a fight. We always know Thomas is one of the sides. Um, but, uh, so, it's that we can choose to cooperate with, with God's grace, or we can be stubborn. Right. Um, we're allowed to say no. We shouldn't. Um, bad things happen when we do. But uh, we've got the capacity, capacity to say no. God wants, uh, God wills that all be saved. But he's not going to override our choice. If we're like, no, we're, okay. we prefer the other thing. Okay, so yeah. our, our doctrine is very similar that you have the ability to say no you have the ability to reject what you don't have is uh the ability in the affirmative that if it weren't for the working and grace of the holy spirit you would not want to turn to god at all but it's the working and grace of the holy spirit that causes that turn uh, of man towards God, towards things that are good, and then from that point he's free to reject, right? But that that without the Holy Spirit, no man would seek out salvation uh, of his own accord. And I think I think we might differ there, um, but that to me that's one of the biggest the biggest um, weaknesses in in Mister Sledge's book here is that he continually points to you as the author and guarantee of your own salvation and saying, why don't you believe? Wouldn't more people choose to believe? Wouldn't more people choose this and choose that? 
And, and to which I say, well, no, no one would, would rightfully choose that without the working of God, the Holy Spirit on their life, right? They wouldn't, mm. they wouldn't react that way. Instead, we react to God's holiness the way sinful men do, which is fear and rejection. We're on the, uh, the one-year lectionary this Sunday for Trinity 5 is, is, is uh, Luke 5, 1 through 11. And the first thing that St. Peter says when uh, the Lord fills the boat with fish is, Depart from me, O Lord, I am a sinful man. Right, And that is the natural sort of uh, reaction to God, right, to holiness, is I don't want that, right? It's this sort of fear of it. Yeah, and it's, uh, we do all, yeah, the, the amazing thing about the question is, uh, it's like, oh, why doesn't he, like, the things that every Christian struggles with are different, and the vast majority of people don't struggle to believe that there's a God. I mean, the vast majority of humanity uh, believes that. They have other issues, for sure. Um, um, we're all sinners, and so God's working with us on these other topics. It's getting to the point of knowing that he's real. It's like, well, look, um, uh, you can take the philosopher Roger Scruton, um, who uh, died a year and a half ago. Um, his whole life, he was struggling with the idea of God's existence, whereas in other things, uh, he's absolute genius philosophically, absolute genius in all of his writings. Um, moral life, fairly good. I, I mean, as good as it can be if you're an atheist who goes to Episcopalian services because they're chill. <laughs> um, um, it, it's, so there are people who struggle with God. Um, but that's a very specific thing, and God's working in their life in a way to bring them to salvation in a way that's different. And so, I mean, uh, I, I, I didn't have a St. Paul experience. I, I assume you didn't have a St. Paul experience. Yeah. It's still a, looking. <laughs> oh, it'd be nice, yeah. but also it'd be, it'd be overkill. It would. Um, it would. It's a. Uh, I, I mean, I'd still take it. I'm not telling God to cancel what He had planned next week. Right. Um, I'll take it. But uh, well, I mean, but at the end of the day, and I've I've never been through a Catholic liturgy. I've never been to a Catholic church myself. But mm -hmm. in in our tradition, anyway, we confess a creed every single week. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. and we've got that too. Great. And see, even in my daily prayer, I always make sure to go through the Apostles' Creed as one of my daily prayers. And it's this, this, you, it's belief in God is so much more than I saw a magician or a wizard do a fancy trick with a snake and a, and a staff, right? It's, I am choosing to believe. It's like being married. I, I have to choose every day to be in love with my wife. Right, mm. it's it's not a feeling; it's a purposeful action. And so every day, even when I don't feel it, even when I don't want to do it, even when I don't care, I still wake up every morning and say, "I believe in God, the Father Almighty, Maker of heaven and earth, etc., cetera, etc." Cetera. Right? It's mm. it's about doing it anyway. Mm. It's a, I mean, there's a weird emotional tinge that they that they bring to this. Mm -hmm. It's like Oh, just do a magic trick. Uh, if you're the son of God, come down from the cross. It's like, yeah. look, we've we've heard this uh, repeatedly. Um, that that's uh, yeah. It's just not how it works. No, no. All right. So your faith is not shaken. No, no, not, not by that one. Okay. But I'm sure he's okay. got. But I'm sure he's uh, going to build up gradually oh. and then have some real doozies. Oh wait. So I gave you two of these up front. So I'm going to give you the mm. second one. The second mm. one that I gave you up front to prepare. The last mm. two you don't know about. You've not prepared for them. Let me tell oh, you. Oh, yeah. But, but those are the ones that will get me. I couldn't I couldn't phone the Vatican and get uh, pre-prepared questions on those. Yeah. Well, here, here we go. Question number two. Why would a heavenly father ban most of his children to hell when he could just send them straight to heaven? Tim Sledge says, people only go to hell when they don't believe. Surely... Jesus could have been more convincing in the resurrection. Why didn't he appear to groups of people? Why didn't he stick around longer? He could have spent weeks after the resurrection teaching and being witnessed by people. Why do four independent eyewitness accounts of the resurrection sound like four independent eyewitness accounts of the resurrection? Oh, uh, first I have to... Surely, uh, surely that wasn't quite the wording. 
Uh, it was a no. I'm sorry. I'm being a little disingenuous. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, <laughs> uh, I, I mean, that, that's exactly his, uh, his claim, though. Yes. So, the... His thing yeah. is, his thing is, they differ, they differ, like, you know, like, oh, the women were at the tomb, but then the other resurrection account is like, Jesus was in the upper room, so like, why di- Why is it different? Well, it's, it's, it's four different people, you idiot. But, why do, so, uh, it's also interesting, uh, his theory of justification that he's assuming. Um, so, one, he mm-hmm. doesn't seem to realize that he's stepping in a can of worms, and that, Unless he's talking to a completely uncatechized audience, um, this is going to raise eyebrows. But he's like, right. all, all you need to get to heaven is to believe, so why didn't he make belief easier? Um, why do he, people have to go to hell? Um, since all you need to do is believe. That's like an implicit thing that he's taking. And, uh, now, I don't claim to have read uh, much Protestant theology, but I feel like, oh, once you're baptized, you're good to go forever, uh, is, is quite what he... Uh, what? So uh, okay, so this is this is the horrifying uh, thing of Protestant theology. Hmm. I'm fairly certain that outside of us Lutherans, because uh, we only retained two sacraments from the Catholic Church, uh, which was the Eucharist and baptism, and we would confess rightly, and I believe along with you that baptism saves. Yes. Um, period. Boom. All the rest of Protestantism disagrees. They think baptism is what they would call an ordinance, uh, which is a law, which is not the gospel because it's the law anyway. Uh, that it's a work you have to do, and and what's wild is that most Protestants have a very specific way you have to do. Mm. You have to do baptism. Mm. It has to be living water, or it has to be full submersion, or you mm. have to be able to make a confession of faith. And it's funny that they have these restrictions and requirements for baptism because they don't think it does anything. So if baptism doesn't do anything, why does it matter if you do it wrong? Mm. It's. <laughs> but no, most most Protestants, they think that you have to say... Uh, they will tell you that that baptism saves is not biblical, that that's wrong. Uh, but they'll turn around and tell you that you have to say a magic incantation at a specific place in the church, i.e. you have to come down to the altar and say the sinner's prayer. And then that's what saves you. It's the magic, mm. the magical words, not, not the water and the word of God. Yeah, that's... So, never... Uh... It, for the background that he has as a Baptist preacher for 40 years, it's kind of understand. Okay, no, I can't give him that. Um, it's still too much. But uh, it's a... If simply believing were all that it took to get to heaven, I, I mean, that'd be a great bargain. Um, especially from a Catholic perspective where it's, no, no, uh, if you've committed a mortal sin, you have to go to confession. If you die between now and confession, you're going to hell. Um, it's like, oh... Um, kind of, uh, you, you can see why people with OCD have certain struggles and yeah. with Catholicism. Um, but a, yeah. so the gist of this question is, why is there a hell? That doesn't sound nice. And Jesus right. said, be nice. So internal yeah. contradiction there. That, that's more or less right. the sense that I get from him. Mm-hmm. And it's like, well, yeah. we have to go back to the first day. God creates the lights, which... I believe it's Aquinas interprets as okay. So he's creating the lights before he creates the sun. Easy solution. Um, so atheists one think that they're the first people to notice this. Uh, and two, the uh, the solution that we've always had is this is creating the angels. And so a third of the angels fell, uh, as we read in Revelation. So a third of them are like, yeah, no, we're out. And so there were people who were created in heaven and then chose to leave. And so one, it's not like this would be off brand if you were to create humans who have the choice between going to heaven or not going to heaven. Right. It's a, well, uh, if you choose something other than him. So God created us for love. Uh, this is a, uh, I mean, um, the third person of the Trinity is the love that spirates both from the Father and from the Son. Sorry, orthobros, it spirates from both, but or it proceeds from both. Um, and, and so we're called to participate in that. And so through baptism, we have the indwelling of this love of the Father for the Son and of the Son for the Father. Um, if we don't want to participate in this love, then, I mean, we're 
biologically capable of doing something else. We have, we can physically just not love God. And so the question isn't, do you believe in God? If you say, yes, I sent to this document. Like if you sign the paper saying, I believe, um, then you go to heaven. It seems to be what he thinks it is. And it's like, well, no, it's one, it's so much more than that in terms of what it asks of you. And two, it's so much more than that in terms of what the experience of a Christian is. Um, you are a right. member of the body of Christ. Uh, this is not a, this is not a, form that you sign. It's like, oh, well, maybe I'll sign it later. This is not... Um, right. And this is not a formality. This is not... I, I mean, you can see his audience, and you can see his thought process. If this is a thing that you do on Saturday, yeah. this is your alternative to football, and so it's a choosing group, which football team to root for, um, but you can only go to heaven if you root for the right team. Uh, if that's your right. mental framework, rather than this is your existence, you are a member in Christ, and you are have the indwelling of the love of God within you. Um, it, so if you don't understand the Trinity, if you don't understand that the Christian life has a encompasses the, the totality of life, then one, it would seem so trivial to get to heaven. And two, hell is completely incomprehensible. It's like, well, I mean, uh, they just didn't sign a paper. That's kind of kind of harsh. They just didn't sign the paper. Right. It's like, well. Exactly. And, well, and, another, and another thing, too, just sort of an offshoot of that, of the just sign the paper idea is that atheists often, riffing on that idea, think it's a huge dunk on Christians that like, that they say like, oh, well, so if Hitler just says, I believe in Jesus before he dies, then he goes to heaven. And they think that like, that that's a, a huge dunk on Christians and on God. And it's like, and it's like, what? That, if anything, that makes me more hopeful because... What a merciful God, what a loving and gracious God that he would take Hitler's deathbed confession and say, good yeah. enough, you're in. Because if he can do that for Hitler, mm -hmm. God knows he can do it mm -hmm. for me, right? Like, how how loving and gracious and merciful is the God that they just accidentally created, yeah. right? It's, like, they think that's a huge dunk, but it's actually really yeah, great. It's a, uh, anybody who's over the age, let's say, 25 has some things that they've done in their life where they're like, eh, uh, so God's forgiven that, and therefore I should get free of that, myself that. But you don't actually do the thing. You know that you should, um, but uh, uh, um, you, uh, you still feel bad about it years later. Everyone's got something like that. Um, and so when we right. see, I, I mean, uh, what we're told is repent and believe. We're not told believe, don't repent. Um, and repentance is right. actually efficacious. Um, there are demands on your life that you not do certain things, and we're going to mess up. But if you repent, uh, I mean, the question totally leaves out what is repentance, what is, what's, what's the ask? If, uh, like, if you, even if you sign the form, but you're like, well, I don't repent of uh, driving a, a bunch of people to abortion clinics. It's like, well, look, you're, you're probably toast. Um, you've got to repent of these things. And asking somebody to repent of their sins is, I mean, leave aside the totality of the Christian life. Just uh, uh, being sorry for your sins is kind of harder than intellectually coming to the position where God exists. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and, and then too, um, and I bumped into this the other day accidentally on Twitter. I posted a tweet about... Uh, don't look at pornography instead of doing that, which could get you cast into hell. Pray. Just go pray instead. It's better for you, and you won't get thrown into hell for prayer. And I had someone get very angry at me because they said, you're not sharing the gospel. You're sharing the law. And, <sighs> like, uh, first off, I very much consider prayer to be the gospel. Um, and directly interacting with God seems very gospel-y to me, one. Uh, two, like, it's, it's, you need to stop doing the bad things. And we understand that you're going to occasionally slip up and do the bad things. We understand that pornography, alcohol abuse, drug abuse, we understand these things are addictions and you will occasionally drop the ball. And the point is that there is 
forgiveness there and there is grace there for when that happens but that doesn't mean that you just get to do them willy-nilly and, right like that's like the thrust of romans yeah, 6 and it's also right yeah the we got rid of the bang works of the law therefore uh, i don't have to love my neighbors like well look you kind of have to pick a side on this all right um, <laughs> yeah yeah another another issue not related to what we're talking about that i would like a, like to pick apart with this this was uh for the most part a direct quote from his book and he says why didn't he appear to groups of people and why didn't he stick around longer i don't know how long he thinks was between the the resurrection and the ascension but i mean it was like a good so month, we right? uh we celebrate the ascension so i might yeah, uh, we're going to see. It's, yeah. it's on the it, it's, calendar. Uh, it's either forty <laughs> yeah, or fifty days. So I, it's either uh, so Pentecost, I believe, is the fifty-day mark, and so Ascension Thursday is forty days. So six round for forty days. Right, which is and, quite a while. And quite so long while. as we're going to Monday morning quarterback, uh, what Jesus did, um, it, it's a he stayed around long enough that uh, so we have the uh, traditional date of thirty-three A.D for his crucifixion and resurrection. The the whole narrative concludes in 33 AD. Uh, and so we have the Great Fire of Rome in, I believe, uh, 65 AD, which Nero blames on the Christians. So he stayed around long enough to tell enough people that this became a big enough deal that the Christians could be scapegoated 30 years later for a, a terrorist atrocity um, uh, several, uh, probably a thousand miles away. Um, it's like, you know, 30 years in the ancient world is not very long. So if if somebody's like, oh well, Jesus didn't stay around long enough to reach critical mass in the religion, it's like, well, look, um, one, there's the speed there, and two, if we're still here, obviously, uh, he stayed around to reach critical mass, um, which is it's a weird objection because if you look if you look at the time uh, uh, between the resurrection and the ascension, you're like he didn't stay around around long enough to establish Christianity firmly. It's like you know. How is Christianity not firmly established today? Um, you can say that people disagree about the, the correct form of Christianity. You can say they're non-Christians. But any objective person looking at the pie chart of uh, world religions is going to say, well, you know, would an extra week back then have been essential to, to making it 100%? Because that doesn't seem plausible to me. Yeah, no, that's, a, that, no, that's brilliant. Yeah, would, would we be at a fully Christian world with an extra week. Mm. Uh, furthermore, he says, he, he, one of his objections is, why didn't Christ appear to groups of people? I believe St. Paul mentions in one of his letters that Christ appeared to literally 500 people at a go and taught them. Mm. And then Paul adds on the tack there. He says, many of whom are not yet asleep. So Paul is literally saying, you can go ask them about it. Mm -hmm. They're still here. Yeah. So, so uh, I guess he just didn't read the Bible. Which we hate to see, because if somebody wants to say, well, the Bible's fake news, it's like, well, we can have that argument. They're wrong, but that's a different argument. But if somebody's like... You should read it first. Yeah. It's a... If you're like, okay, you shouldn't be a Christian because of this thing that... The, it, it's like, uh, if you... Have quite, uh, if you read the Bible and then you say, okay, what if I hadn't read that, that would be... An, it, it's weird, because there's no way he's as scripturally ignorant as one would have to be for these questions. And yet he's asking questions that the Bible has answers to. It's like you're reading an FAQ and then you keep reading uh, Qs that have a that have answers in them, but they're like, yeah, I only have half the FAQ. We don't have any of the... None of the questions are here. Or none of the answers are here. Right. They're all there. Mm. They're all yeah. there. It's uh, the uh, problem is there's a there's a a, a a Lutheran satire video by by Pastor Hans Feeney mm -hmm. where hang on just a second uh, that's embarrassing my uh, Amazon CIA device decided uh, to kick off oh you've got start playing a music oh you've got the Elf on the Shelf uh, FBI edition I do um, I do yeah no, it's great um, but. Uh, there's a, a Lutheran satire video by Pastor Feeney, and he sort of mocks 
this idea, but with swimming, where there's these two swimming instructors in the deep end of the pool, and there's a guy in the shallow end of the pool, and he's like, he's like, you know, no one knows how to do a breaststroke. Why has no one ever thought about how hard it is to do a backstroke? And the two swimming instructors down at the deep end of the pool are like, hey, we actually talk about this stuff all day, every day, and we've never seen you come down here to the deep end to ask us these questions. You've always been standing in the ankle deep water over mm. there, you know, and that's kind of the, I, I don't know, it's like the perfect picture of this, mm. right? Like, there's peop, there, there, the answers to these questions are there. In 2,000 years of Christian history, you have not thought of something that someone else way smarter than you or me has already not thought yeah. of, right? Like, you're not original here. Yeah, everyone's desire to be, to say that uh, their grandmother knew everything about Christianity, and since your grandmother could answer a question, therefore it's unanswerable. It's like, well, one, right. your grandma's in heaven, so take some lessons. Two, uh, two <laughs> she's not, uh, her job was not to be the theology professor. Uh, right. Her job was to get to heaven, and to help you get to heaven. And Nailed it. Yeah. Yeah. All right, so faith, your faith, your Catholic faith, mm. still intact. Oh, yes. Now, uh, the, these are, I had read two of these, uh, these two before, so as, as we escalate, um, they might get me. Okay. I think th this next one's a doozy. I don't know how okay. you're going to deal with this one. <laughs> I'm sorry. Okay, I'm going to read it now. Okay. okay. Right. I believe in you. Thank you. Why does faith in the resurrected, empowering Jesus generate such inconsistent results? Mr. Sledge says, and this is a direct word-for-word -word quote from the book, True faith begins when you, at a specific point in your life, believe repent of your sins, and fully commit yourself to Jesus. This is what it means to be a Christian, and it's how you begin a personal relationship with God. And when your decision to follow Jesus is genuine, your faith will persevere no matter what. Oh, so... <laughs> Where do you start? So, why are the results inconsistent? Uh, so, the results being inconsistent, it's like, well, but we're inconsistent. Uh, it's a... So, let's say... So, my struggle is not a... Uh, let's say alcoholism. Um, there are people who are alcoholics, and they uh, aren't Christians in any sense. They find God, and then they struggle, and then they, uh, through their faith, they struggle with their alcoholism. Now, some of these people are able to give up alcohol immediately. You're good to go on to other battles. Other people still struggle with alcoholism the rest of their life. Um, they still fall down quite often. Um, it's that, it's what's God, what, God is calling everybody to different things. And so he'll give different people different things they have to work through. Somebody, it might be, God wants you to struggle through alcoholism to reach him. Uh, whereas other people, it's like, well, you picked up alcoholism, but that's not, I want you to struggle in a different way. And so I'm going to take away the alcoholism and then you're going to be fine on that front. But then I'm going to give your, let's say I'm going to give your spouse cancer and then you're going to have to love her and trust me through that. I mean, we've all got different things that we struggle with. And it, it's, so it's like, well, he prayed his, uh, his alcoholism away. Um, why couldn't he get rid of my alcoholism? It's like, well, we've all got these different problems. He wants a. You're not him. Yeah, um, it, it's a God wants a diversity of things in heaven. Um, God likes lots of different things. I mean, uh, the, the uh, sort of kitschy Catholic speaker example would be: look at how many insect species we have. He loves having a multitude of different things, um, and so different things that we have to overcome uh, and trust him about. If somebody trusts you with a lockbox but wouldn't trust you with their liquor cabinet, well, that's a certain relationship. Um, if it's like, if, uh, I come to visit somebody's house and they're like, okay, well, um, he has free range of the cupboard, but don't let him, uh, hang out with the dog. It's like, okay, well, that's kind of weird. Um, but he's giving us each different responsibilities and he's asking us to trust him on different issues. Right. And so the fact that we all have 
these unique experiences. It's not... At no point did our, did our Lord say that we would all have the exact same experience of getting there. It's pick up your cross. Correct, yeah. And crosses come in... Uh, you can find interesting discussions of people discussing what the cross, what kind of wood the cross was made out of, which mostly fruitless when, it, when we're discussing our Lord. I mean, there's something possibly to it, but not my thing. But all of our crosses are made out of different materials. Some of them are different shapes. Some of them are uh, different textures. Some of them uh, have wheels on them, it seems. And then it's like, well, um, if, you, if our Lord gave you ten talents, that this does not mean you're rich. This means that you've got more problems. Um, I'd much rather be given one talent and then just not hide it in the earth than ten talents and have to go get ten more. It's So different experiences is not... Yeah, it's asking, why did God make everybody a different height? Okay, but... But... Once you have... Once you make a genuine decision to follow Jesus, mm-hmm. your faith will persevere to the end, right? Oh, so... Uh... Yeah, I... Excuse the pagan example, but... No, my, my uh, childhood formation was much more... It was secular classical, and so I have to go to... Homer to the uh, to the Odyssey, so you've got this long distance relationship of twenty years where both sides are occasionally doubting, and uh, it's sort of like that. We're in a long distance relationship with God a lot of the time, and so do you trust this person? It, it's really easy to just go to somebody in a long distance relationship or to say, "Yeah, no, can't handle it. Time to break up." The fact that right. uh, you're dating somebody or you're married to somebody who's in a different country and you can't visit often, or perhaps ever. Uh, it's like, okay, well, on one hand, that's hard. On the other hand, the fact that you got together is... means that you should see things through. You should act responsibly. But at the same time, it's like, oh, well, if you started dating long distance, there's no way that you could realize later that it doesn't work for you. Um, it's like, no, of course you can realize that uh, you can't handle it. Now, you can handle it with God, and you should handle it, but if somebody decides later, no, no, I, uh, I committed without understanding that this would cost everything. Right. That's not, not an argument against God. That's an argument against you. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. No, that's it. That's the that's the mic drop, right? It is. It's not. You're not arguing against God here. You're not making a point against God. You're making a point against the weakness of man. Right. It's God's not the fallible one. In this relationship, right? Really fine. So, your Catholic mm. faith. Oh, Intense. oh. So it's in fact intensified because I'm thinking of uh, Peter denying Christ three times. It's like, yeah, no. It's in fact, it's not mm-hmm. uh, the whole. You're going to persevere to the end if you've made a genuine commitment. It's like you know, no. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Yeah, no. That's no. That's a solid example. Okay, I got you. I've got you with this last one. It got me. Um, I just, I know you're about to be literally Chad the Atheist right now. Chad, why did it Jesus tell us about germs? God has been watching silently For thousands of years, by the time Jesus came along, it was already late in the game, but couldn't one titled The Great Physician have contributed a little bit more to public health? (laughs) So, one has to assume that our Lord, being a carpenter, would have made... So, uh, we have the old roller coasters made of wood. So, today's roller coasters, they're all steel, but we had wooden ones. So, so I'm greatly disappointed that our Lord didn't build any of these cool wooden roller coasters that we could use. Um, yeah, no, he definitely he, knew he, how. Yeah, he had the know-how, he had the materials. Uh, and, uh, and so... Yes, it shakes my faith that he didn't build roller coasters. Uh, because, I mean, come on. Uh, surely, 
<laughs> but Chad, <laughs> but Chad, I say to you, that wasn't why he came. That mm. wasn't the point. Oh, I mean, uh, and so for throwing out scripture and then going off of what would a nice guy do? Uh, so if you don't open the Bible yeah. and you say, what would a nice guy do? Um, a nice guy who knows everything. Uh, so, yeah, th- th- there's no way that... So the uh, the physician in Germany who discovered that washing your hands between patients um, reduced infant mortality. Uh, so he kept telling his colleagues to do this, and he did it. Um, and his colleagues said, no, you're crazy. And so they locked him in an insane asylum and had him murdered by the guards. It's like, you can find this on Wikipedia. This isn't like... Oh, weird print stuff. Yeah. yeah, it's, um, bangs, yeah. it's a... So, there's the, the instant where the uh, crippled man has his friends let him down, through, break up the roof, and drop him down on a mat to uh, to see Sarah Lord ask to be healed. And so, uh, and so our Lord leans in and he says, uh, your faith hath... Uh, uh, this, is, this is great faith. Uh, your sins are forgiven me. And the Pharisees look around, it's like, uh, what's he doing? This is crazy. You can't just forgive sins. Uh, and then he's like, okay, uh, since the important thing that you don't believe is there, uh, I'll give you a stupid, inconsequential thing that's very ostentatious and flashy, uh, which is, now your plague is, or now, now you can walk. Uh, I believe it was a, a, a cripple and not plague, but... Uh, uh, so he looked, yeah, the Catholic scriptural knowledge. Uh, but uh, it's a, so germ theory, it's like, okay, yeah, this would be a very conspicuous show of power. But if he wanted to do a conspicuous show of power, then he would have had 12 legions of angels show up in Gethsemane. And, I mean, uh, yeah. Slaughter the Roman uh, guards, it's, yeah. He's not there for personal attention. He's not there, uh, I mean, he'll heal you, but he didn't heal everybody on Earth. He healed a few thousand people throughout Judea. Um, and that's good. Um, but that's not the point. The point is to save every, everybody from death. Uh, it, the point is to come and save us from sin and death. Uh, and to uh, yep. remind everybody that... Uh, yeah, no, you can't... Yeah. Uh, so he comes at the point of the greatest temporal prosperity the world's ever seen in the Roman Empire. Um, and when you've got Pharisees who are probably executing Leviticus the best that uh, Leviticus has ever, ever been executed. So he's like, okay, so that's cool. However, if you walk up to a homeless dude and then blow a trumpet and then hand him a penny, this is still not cool. Um, he's right. making a much bigger point that even if you want to look at it from a secular perspective, it's like, okay, so he's saying that... It, it's so bizarre because... Every secularist will tell you, you should love the poor. You should love your neighbor. Um, whereas, if you don't have, if you don't believe in Christ, then, yeah, no. Care, love your enemies? This makes no sense. Uh, unless this were a divine commandment. This is, uh, you cannot just come up with this in a secular way and then have it make any sense. This is expressly a divine commandment. That animates what we do. Whereas, we can figure, like, he didn't come down to tell us, don't commit murder. Everybody kind of figured that out, naturally. Uh, he came down to tell right. us that we needed to be baptized, we needed to repent, we needed to love our neighbor, we needed to do these crazy things that you can't figure out for yourself. Mm-hmm. And, and yep. he, he came down to say, uh, that not only should you not commit murder, but if someone is actively murdering you, mm. you should love them while they're doing that. Right? Uh, we were... Uh, a friend of mine texted me something earlier today that was, that he saw on Facebook, and and it was about how praying to any person of the Trinity other than other than than God the Father was wrong, and that there's no biblical example of anyone praying to any other person of the Trinity. And the first thing I pointed out was in Acts seven where Stephen is being stoned to death, and he prays to Jesus, right? And, and what's, what's the thing he prays is forgive them and, and, and love them. You know, it's sort of the Jesus' prayer on the cross. They don't know what they're doing, right? And so it's this, not only are you, are you not supposed to murder, uh, but you're not even supposed to hate. Not only are you not supposed to commit adultery, you're not even supposed yeah. to look lustfully, right? Don't, not, not only are you not supposed to take things that belong to your neighbor, 
I don't want you to even want to take them. And, and I know this is, this is going to be um, uh, out of your realm here, but Martin Luther, in his treatment of the Ten Commandments, really does a wonderful job with this because he takes all of the Ten Commandments and he frames them in the Catechism of the Lutheran Church as loving your neighbor. And so then, do not steal. How do we frame this in terms of loving our neighbor? So not only should I not take what belongs to my neighbor, but I should help my neighbor amass more than he has. I should help my neighbor benefit and grow. Not only should I not kill my neighbor, but I should be willing to lay down my life to defend my neighbor. Right? And he takes it sort of to this other extreme. Yeah. It's, it's, yeah, it's, I don't know, uh, it's brilliant. Yeah, the idea of he came here to tell, give us secular goodies. It's like, you know, he came here as a homeless guy who right. gets murdered by the state, turned over to the state by his uh, by his own sort of uh, ethnic machine. So basically, Tammany Hall turns him over to the uh, to the overall empire. It's like, okay, so he came here for everybody to kill him. Everyone to unite together and kill this one random homeless dude. Uh, he did not come to give a yeah. biology lesson. He came to tell us that... Uh, yeah, he came to abolish death, not to abolish a cause of death. Right. And, and, and that's, I mean, that's exactly it. Because even if he had told us all about germs, uh, you would still get hit by a bus and go to hell. Right? Like, okay, so at least you didn't yeah, it's a, die of the flu. It, it's such a, a shallow complaint, because, okay, he also didn't tell us that there was a whole few more continents that nobody had seen yet. Uh, if he was trying to give you a, right. a tip to make money, uh, he's not giving you, okay, this horse is going to win this race. He's not giving you a, no, no, actually, if you wash your hands at this time, um, in between uh, t uh, talking to patients, they'll live. It's like, one, either of those would have gotten you killed anyway, uh, mission failed. <laughs> uh, two, this is just not what he's interested in. He's not concerned in trifling matters. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and as you brought up earlier with the, the gentleman that did discover the washing hands thing, we, we wouldn't have believed him yeah. anyway. Uh, I mean, we wouldn't have cared. Does, does, this, uh, does this author, this atheist, want a St. Paul experience for everyone to believe in germ theory? Yeah, well, he would find the Christian religion much more convincing if 2,000 years later we were like, hey, wait a minute, that Jesus guy said something about that. If, right. there, if there were unexplained passages, I mean, what, uh, this is not a... There's also a, ten, uh, a tendency towards Gnosticism here, isn't there? In that, oh, he should have left a coded message so that um, after we discovered calculus, we could uh, do this with it. Um, he should have left certain encoded things. It's like, you know, right. when Isaac Newton was doing weird math problems on the Bible to try and compute everybody's name, because Newton was a weird dude. Still like him, but dude was insane. Um, so, uh, and you have all these Protestants trying to decode when the end of the world will be based off of math in the Bible. It's like, yeah. Um, uh, lady should not read Revelations yeah. and then come up with any new ideas. Uh, it, it always ends badly. Um, we have uh, like the joke about three thirty thousand Protestant sects. It's like okay, well that's overstating it, but uh, every time somebody new reads Revelations, right. and then it's like okay, here's my personal interpretation of Revelations. Revelations is just um, yeah, uh, yeah, it unleashes a lot. But our Lord did not tell us encode these things. And so looking and saying, if he was really God, he would give us these things in code. Uh, there'd be like a veiled reference to germ theory. There'd be a veiled reference to new continents. There'd be a veiled reference to the moon landings. Yeah. Um, Oil. It's like, well, right. look, that's not what he was doing. Um, this is not an economic program. This is not a guide to building utopia. He's going to build utopia and he's going to bring it down to us. Uh, we're going to sit here and carry yeah. crosses around. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And. And I just, I also, real quick, I want to take issue with the, well, if he was really God, he would X, Y, and Z. I would just like to say, if he, if Jesus really is God, the thing that he would do is be born of the Virgin Mary in a manger. He would live his life, uh, grow up, 
in Galilee, right? He would preach the kingdom of heaven. He would ultimately be murdered by his own people on a cross in exchange for Barabbas of all people. He would willingly go to that cross instead of Barabbas. He would die, lay in that grave for three days, and, and, and rise again from the dead. And these are the things that he would do if he truly is God. And I know that because he truly is God, and that's what he did, right? And so like the arrogance to then mm-hmm. step in and say, oh, yeah. well, if I was God, I would X, Y, and Z. Well, if yeah. you were God, it's we'd all a, probably be in hell. Like, there are plenty of things I don't understand. But it's like, you know, I mean, mm-hmm. one, the, the perspective you have to have for that is having never gone from square one to square ten. Uh, because you can always look back in hindsight and say, okay, why, why, why uh, were things that I had to deal with structured in that way? Like, let's say it's a class. It's like, why is it structured in that way? If I were the teacher, I'd do it this way. And then once yeah. you get to the end of the semester, like, oh, wait, yeah, I had to be in that order. Um, uh, you had to have that prerequisite. Yeah, right. Um, and yeah. Uh, so you have to have never had the experience of being frustrated that something was a certain way and then realizing, actually, um, that's the only way it could be done um, or that's the best way to do it. You have to just have never yeah. been in the position where you learned yeah. that an authority figure was confusing, but right. Which, I don't, I don't know if it's... It'd be uncharitable for me to say that this guy's arguing in bad faith. However, there are an awful lot of best-selling atheist books, and atheists love uh, conversion stories as much as Christians do. They're just as gung-ho. Yes. And so if you want to sell book, yeah. And they, mm. well, they all write the same book, right? They all write the same book. They all mm. have the same reasons for abandoning the faith. The same singular reason. And that reason is, is poor catechism. I, I think that's a, uh, a reason for a lot of people to believe. But I think, I, I mean, the sexual morality is probably... Yeah, um, I don't want to open windows into people's hearts, but everyone who leaves seems to, uh, yeah, they don't leave. It's like, oh, actually, well, the Big Bang happened, therefore God doesn't exist, which is stupid because that for uh, that's stupid for a thousand reasons, including that the Big Bang Theory is a Jesuit tactic to use math to prove God. But uh, I don't fully understand, I can't fully articulate how that works because the physics gets a little beyond me. But uh, there are atheists who are like, oh, well, um, I'm a rational, detached, objective person with no emotions um, and no sentiments. Therefore, I'm going to follow the science and there's no God, which doesn't quite work. But um, if the first thing they do is everything that that their parents told them not to do, I'm going to be a little suspicious about their motivations here. Um, Did you really science your way out of God or did you hear somebody smarter than you say that science means you can do whatever you want? And so you just want to do whatever you want. Um. Right. Right. Yeah. Did you, do you really, did you come to a nuanced mm. understanding mm. of theology, yeah. philosophy, science, history, and religion? Or is there a 20 year old throwing herself at you and mm. your wife doesn't approve, yeah. obviously, but you still want to kind of, yeah. yeah. I, so I take these God people seriously. Real, I just so take okay. uh, all the religious nuns in this country. Um, it's like, oh, I have no religion. It's like, well, do you believe in horoscopes? Because if you say that you believe in horoscopes, then uh, science and objectivity and the enlightenment and all these things that people love to use as buzzwords. Yeah. Um, it's like, uh, so prove your science credentials by uh, first denounce uh, healing crystals, horoscopes, uh, reincarnation. Just throw all that out at the front or else you're... Um, you're just mad at, you're, uh, you're, you still believe in, yeah, you reject Christianity because of the magic part, uh, not because of the magic part, but because of the morals part. Right. And there was, and there was shrieking and wailing and a thousand white women could be heard dying that day. <laughs> well, literally, Chad, it has been so wonderful. I think this has been Probably the most ecumenical dialogue between a Lutheran and a Catholic in the past 500 years. Oh, glad to hear it. Glad to hear it. 
Uh, we must have more of this. We should. We should. We uh, should. Absolutely. And it will happen uh, in the gulag someday. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, they're going to kill us the same anyway. So, mm. here we are. Mm. Uh, it was lovely to have you. Thank you so much for agreeing to do this. And I would love to have you back on sometime if I could just oh, make your public commitment. Oh, absolutely. Uh, you, uh, you have it on record. Recording button is still on. Uh, I yep. still see the little red dot, so mm -hmm. everything contractually binding. This is, I'm assenting as much as Baptist assent and then live their whole lives never doubting and never sinning. <laughs> Wonderful. Uh, Wonderful. What great faith that we should all strive to have. Yes. Chad, it was so great to have you on, man. Thank you so much. Have a, a wonderful night, sir. Uh, thank you. And you as well.